13 years ago, someone told me to buy Bitcoin at $28 a coin. Like you and everyone else, I didn't do it because nobody could explain to me what the f it actually did. But today, Bitcoin is the ninth largest currency on earth and it only took 6,132 days to do it. What's going on here? And more importantly, what happens if this thing just keeps on going? Give me nine minutes of your time and I will explain to you what took me a thousand hours to understand about Bitcoin and why it might be the most misunderstood but important discovery of our lifetime. All right, so first off, money isn't real. It's not paper or numbers on a screen. Money is a made up medium, basically a group hallucination. It's just a concept that we agree on so that we can trade the value of our energy. Because without it, you're stuck with barter and you can't just walk into a store and say, trust me, this milk is worth a pack of cigarettes. So we started wrapping that value in universal things that we could all agree on, like these things. Wrappers that made exchanging value portable, storable, and easy to send. The problem is, is that every wrapper so far has had a backdoor controlled by middlemen. Banks, credit card companies, governments, which means they don't just hold our trust, they can abuse it. Banks can freeze your account if they don't like your political views. Credit cards can reverse your transactions and not even tell you why. But maybe the biggest abuser of this trust Governments, they can print unlimited amounts of these things, and they do. And that's why a Big Mac costs $9. So what about Bitcoin? Where does Bitcoin fit into all of this? Well, the man, woman, or space alien that invented Bitcoin called out this trust problem on the very first appearance they made on the internet. The root problem with conventional currencies is all the trust that's required to make it work. The central bank must be trusted not to debase the currency, but the history of fiat currencies is full of breaches of that trust. And that's why humans have been searching for thousands of years for a self-sustaining money system that doesn't require any trust, like gold. Unlike dollars, gold can't be printed. You gotta rip it out of the ground with pickaxes and explosions. And if someone tries to fake it, you can usually tell, unless you're into spray painted rocks. Plus, gold's got dope brand recognition from pharaohs to pirates to priests to rappers. It's like the Coca Cola of money. But the problem is, gold itself needs its own wrapper. The other wrapper. How am I gonna use gold to pay for my Starbucks? Shave off a tiny little piece for my pumpkin spice latte? No. That's retarded. To actually use gold, people had to trust middlemen again to issue wrappers. Paper notes or bank balances backed by gold. And every time, middlemen abuse it. Banks print more gold than they have in their vaults. Governments raid the vaults themselves, then suspend the gold promise when it's inconvenient. In other words, back doors sneak right back in. So even gold, the most trusted money humans have ever had, failed the trust test. So we got a big ass trust problem. I just want to pay for this pumpkin spice latte. How do you go about making a money with no back doors that I can also use to buy my Netflix? There's plenty of attempts before Bitcoin. They all failed because there's four big problems you have to solve in order to make functional digital money. Digital money sounds great until you realize computers have this one little trick. Right click, copy, paste. That works for Evanescence MP3s, but if it works for money, game over. I'm command being my way to a goddamn duplex. This is called the double spend problem, and it's the reason why we needed bankers and governments to begin with, to stop the counterfeiting. But the second you do that, you're trusting someone again, who probably hates you. So what does Satoshi do? He invents the blockchain. Big word, annoying word. Basically just means a giant scoreboard for money in the sky. Bob sends 10 Bitcoin to Julian. Julian sends five Bitcoin to Moku. Every time that money moves, it's recorded in the cloud for everyone else to see. So this time, if someone tries to spend the same coin twice, the scoreboard just shouts back, <laughs> Nah, homie, already used that one. Copy and paste problem solved. Okay, we are starting to cook with this Bitcoin thing, but now you're gonna get a second problem. Who exactly is allowed to update this blockchain and how? If it's just one guy, he's gonna write, Julian sent me 10,000 Bitcoin. Thanks, bro. So maybe we try first come, first serve? Cool, until the guy with the fastest Wi-Fi wins every time. Okay, maybe we take a vote? Cool, except on the internet, a cheater can spin up a million fake accounts and outvote you. So what do we do? If we don't wanna trust a banker again, we're gonna need some sort of system where anyone can be a writer so that it's fair, 
but nobody can spin up a thousand fake writers for free. That's where Bitcoin does something wild. It turns money into a game with strict rules. Proof of work is a big game or algorithm that replaces the banker in the banking system. In essence, it lets all of us be the banker instead of just uh, these little goblin guys from Harry Potter. JK Rowling keeping it real subtle out there. So what does this game actually look like? Think of it like trying to guess a password. Not really strategic, not really skillful, just brute force. Your computer guesses. Wrong. Wrong. Guesses again. Wrong. Eventually, one of the computers gets it right. Click. Unlock. Congrats, you win the round. You get to add the next page to the magic money scoreboard in the sky. Kind of a boring game if you think about it. Now, just because you've won doesn't mean you get to make up transactions. All the transactions are already floating around the network. You're just bundling them into a page and off she goes. So why all this guessing password stuff? Because it's the best way to keep the game fair without needing a referee. It's expensive to win. You've got to use real electricity and that makes it impossible for cheaters to flood the system with fake players for free. But it's also easy to check. We just put in your password once, and if it works, we know that you did the work. And it's that combination of hard to win, but easy to verify that lets the math replace the banker. All right, but now we got a third problem. What if some nerd throws a supercomputer at this thing? Wouldn't he just get all the Bitcoin for himself? Bitcoin's got a solution to this too. It's called the difficulty adjustment. Every two weeks, the Bitcoin protocol looks at how fast the passwords are being cracked. Too easy? Add a few zeros. Too hard? Take some away. Now, in actuality, these are not three digits or five digits. They're more like 80 to 160, and they include letters as well. Eventually, it goes from thousands of different tries per minute to quadrillions of tries per nanosecond. But on average, no matter how many people are playing, someone will guess the password and update the scoreboard roughly every 10 minutes. Why 10? It's the sweet spot. Faster, and the scoreboard would be updating so frequently it would crash grandma's Wi-Fi. Slower, and it would take forever to receive a payment. That's why 10 minutes is perfect. It's Bitcoin's heartbeat. All right, so we've solved a lot of problems, but we've missed maybe the most important one of them all. Why should anyone give a shit about all of this. You have to give them something for participating. You play the password game, you burn the electricity, you keep the scoreboard honest. You get paid in Bitcoin. That's all that mining is. Okay, great. You're paying me in Bitcoin. But why should I care? How much are they possibly worth? Well, for starters, there will only be 21 million of them forever. No government can sneak into the back door and print more of it because it's all transparent and open source. And if you understand how this whole system works, how it removes almost every trust issue humans have had with money over the last thousand years, you'll realize it's kind of like mining gold, except your computer is the pickaxe and you know exactly how much gold will exist forever. So let's zoom out for a second. In 6,132 days, Bitcoin went from zero to the ninth largest currency on earth. No king signed it into law, no corporation launched it. That has never happened before in history. And it only works because every piece fits together in this perfect puzzle. The blockchain makes copying and pasting money impossible. But a blockchain is only as strong as its writer. So Bitcoin makes them play proof of work. Proof of work could be gamed by raw computing power, so the difficulty adjustment prevents one player from dominating. Players need a reason to do all this work, so the protocol rewards them in Bitcoin. And rewards need to be valuable in order to matter, so a 21 million supply cap means every coin is irreplaceable. This is Bitcoin, a perfect puzzle of incentives, math, and energy. For the first time in a long time, people now have a choice between two very different monetary systems. On one side, dollars, pesos, euros, all run on politics with broken trust and an unlimited supply. On the other side, Bitcoin, open source global software rooted in mathematics capped at 21 million. Nobody can predict the price of Bitcoin, but everybody is able to predict the price of the dollar and where it's going. Because of that, Bitcoin has its place. It's the first monetary system in history that belongs to no one and everyone.